Hey, everybody. Welcome to the book leads, impactful books for life and leadership. I'm your series host and leadership performance coach, John Germillo. This podcast series is about getting to the books that have impacted the lives of the people in my network, leaders, colleagues, old and new. I want to get to those books that have made an impact in their lives. So these are great leads to get to those books that have provided value, long, long lasting value, and have really made an impression on them. And the three categories of books that I cover in this in this series are a book that uh, they cover with me that I've never read. Uh, the second category is where we're both uh, covering a book that we've read, both of us in the past or specifically for the episode. The third category is when I speak to the author and or publisher about the book that they want to get out there to the, mas the masses, sharing that tone, sharing those ideas with us. And in this particular episode, my guest is Garrett Delph, and Garrett's mission is to help medium to large businesses transform operational chaos into system-led cultures that are repeatable and sustainable into the future. As a founder, CEO, operator with proven and demonstrated success, he has spent the last 25 plus years building and scaling three businesses worldwide. With established subject matter expertise in leading and scaling people, processes, and culture, Garrett has a deep understanding of the critical role technology-first operational leadership plays in organizational success, particularly in specialized and high-stakes environments. One of his professional strengths is the systematic elimination of chaos through the implementation of proprietary operational frameworks, optimization of processes, alignment of teams, and the driving of sustainable growth. The culmination of his approach is a sturdy operational transformation to ensure repeatable and sustainable success. And Garrett's team had reached out when he had heard about the series, about coming on the series, sharing his background, his experience in a book that has impacted him. Uh, Anytime that happens, we go back and forth with that prospective guest. And just to get a sense of who they are, they get a sense of my work, and we decide whether or not to proceed with that conversation. Obviously, I wanted to have Garrett here for this conversation to kind of glean his insights from his experience based on what I read in the bio. So, Garrett, thank you so much for being here. Hey, thanks for having me, John. We're really, really happy to, to be here and have the conversation. Absolutely. And so I always start with, who are you today? Garrett, if you could start with what the work that you're doing today looks like, what does your day to day look like? So we get a sense of who it is that's sharing these insights for the, the coming book that we're going to discuss with us. Yeah, great question. So um, my my day to day is focused on um, my operational partnerships with founders, CEOs and C-suite that mostly um, are hyper focused on growth, and they've hit sort of um, two two uh, challenges. One is they got to the place where they are without uh, building rails and infrastructure for scale, or they they got to the place where they are. They're you know trying to break through. They built infrastructure and rails for scale, but ignored it along the way as they focused on sales and marketing. And now um, they've become uh, debilitated because uh, the the infrastructure which they once had is now gone. So my primary role is to come in and restructure, reorganize, um, and load balance all of the moving parts. I call it the sort of uh, the engine of success. And so that in both of those scenarios, the businesses can get back to scaling uh, for growth but not at the cost of um, high stress, low happiness, and uh, in inefficient waste in the business. Can you speak to that a little? Just uh, the last part that you spoke about, um, about happiness. Uh, how does that play into it? Because, I mean, very, very rarely do you hear somebody talk about the work that they want to do. I mean, you're hearing about it more and more. Right. Uh, the work that they want to come in, help somebody scale up, become more efficient, really glean their their business and and take what they can from it and grow it and scale it. But then where does that piece fall? Why does that piece fall into this for you? That, yeah. that attention, that acknowledgement, at least acknowledgement of the right. happiness components. Right. You know, uh, man, John, by God's grace, I, I feel like it's it's been this sort of perfect storm for me. Um, in uh, building my last couple of businesses, especially, and as we, you know, scaled internationally, uh, being uh, not having at the time any mentors or tools to understand 
how important it is you take care of your people and that really great companies are built by great people and companies that care about their people. I didn't know that. And so I sort of fell into the bucket, which most founders do that want to grow and they're militant about growing is you grow at all costs. And, and typically that is at the expense of caring for your people, which I didn't know any better. Um, as along the way, as I, I realized um, that actually is really detrimental um, to the business and to the people. Uh, simultaneously, as I was going through my own growth curve there, uh, I began to see in the marketplace um, and in in the uh, luck, you know, reoccurring conversations in the social channels about there's a sort of this uh, revolt from the bottom where, where people were standing up and saying, hey, wait, I realize you pay me uh, to work for you, but I'm not going to stand for toxicity. And mm. I'm not going to stand for uh, abuse, whatever form that comes in. Uh, I actually, I'd rather not work for you and make less or not have a job than work for you and be part of that can cancerous culture, you know? Yeah. Uh, and as, as it turned out, I had m my big epiphany in that area and was making drastic changes to change that. And I do mean drastic. And um, so it was like the sort of really like I said, perfect storm um, where I, I turn the corner and begin to value, really value what that means in a business to care for people through structure. Uh, and then it turned into actually becoming my, uh, my halftime profession. And I, you know, I anticipate it will be uh, until I'm, I'm done working, doing this current work. Yeah. So, Garrett, when it comes to you in in the work uh, and your company, what does that look like when you when you come into an organization? Can you just give us not not giving away the secret, not giving away yeah. the recipe, but just an overview of of what an example of of what that might look like with an organization from your past? Just like a a general case study kind of overview. Sure, sure. Well, uh, the the trend uh, I've known about, but now that I'm working with businesses. Um, and, and, you know, they're lifting up their hoods and, and have been, and they show me kind of what their engine looks like. It's generally very normal for businesses not to have job descriptions and not to have, um, uh, orderly instructions and guidelines for people process and performance. So typically that's where I'll start putting my focus, uh, on the people side. You know, we start looking at, do you have an org chart? And does your org chart have job descriptions that line, line up with titles, focus, and activities? Uh, do you have employee handbooks that even like little things, right? They uh, tell them exactly how their um, uh, vacation policies will work and who to go to when they want to take a day off and how, and how that's governed. Um, do you have leadership playbooks, uh, leadership agreements cross functionally, vertically and horizontally? Um, and, and do you have process for your people? These are just some, uh, I know they sound really basic, but um, you may or may not be surprised. Most businesses don't have them. And so uh, do, do they have uh, another uh, area that's really important that I take a look at is, do you have career paths um, where, you know, when you hire great people, they want to grow. They want to grow in title and they want to grow in pay. So we'll, we'll take a look at that F to protect the business. Um, mm -hmm. Always another important area looking at, do you have a succession plan? So if your people leave, which they will, do you have um, methods and ways to pass the baton the moment, you know, really important people in your business, which you pay to develop IP when they leave, is there a, a somebody that can step in and pick up from where they left off with all of that knowledge transfer in place? So there's like 60, 90 seconds uh, of, you know, very important areas that tend to be uh, pretty uh, either underdeveloped or not developed at all that make a big difference in caring for people. Yeah. You mentioned <clears throat> that these may come across as basic. What's yeah. incredible is, yeah, I've, I've worked with and in different organizations that didn't have this stuff. Yeah. <laughs> and just because you have it doesn't mean you use it. That's right. You know what I mean? You'll, you'll mm -hmm. go through it and you'll see, you know, last updated 1993 or last updated yes. 2007. It's like, 
those are completely different worlds built on completely different technology based on I mean, just thinking about values, uh, right. a different um, attention to the importance of values, to the importance of employee health, the way that you're talking about um, toxicity in the workplace is looked at differently than it was 10, 15 years ago. So that all dictates the wording that goes into these kind of manuals and handbooks. So yeah, you say yeah, it's the typically most of the time it is the basic stuff that needs that's needed to uh, improve organizations like they're just not even paying attention to the basic stuff. They're shooting for the high stuff, but they're not working on their solid foundation. So I appreciate you sharing all those points that you consider when you when you come into an organization. Yeah, really, really well put. I I, I like your, like, um, I haven't ha heard it put that way, but I I think you're spot on. You know, it it is the, the basics that actually when harnessed and um, held fast to, makes such an amazing difference in the org. Um, you know, you're, you're talking about, uh, you know, uh, last time it was updated was back in the nineties or something. Um, it's and, a different and, world. I mean, it is, it is, it's a man. completely different world. So yes, we may be thinking of like the, the economy, the marketplace is just a completely different world. You know, uh, technology, social media wasn't around back then. Yeah. So just the the cultural zeitgeist is just completely different, and that dictates. Yep. Believe it or not, how you're going to run your build your business. Like, what is it that people? The way people understood the workplace then, because of their mentality, was different compared to somebody coming into an organization. An yeah. organization now, their expectations are just different. They were they would come in easier, saying, "Okay, I'm here. I got to adhere to the to what they want. I need the paycheck." Where now it's we all still need that paycheck, whatever it may be. But now it's kind of like, okay, what? There is that matter of toxicity. There is that matter of acknowledgement of people. You know, you don't have yeah. to kiss my behind, but how is our working relationship? Because I, I do want to commit myself to an organization, and, and if that culture is not there, yeah. Um, and people may say, well, the handbooks are different from culture. No, but the handbooks show you what is priority in culture. Those are all setting up people for success. And if they come in and see that your handbooks haven't been updated since the last decade. That's right. That shows a lot. That plants a seed in their mind that, okay, these people don't really, they're just looking forward to the goals and they're not looking at, um, yeah, their foundation. Yeah. You know, when it's great thoughts, um, you, you know, we, we give businesses a hard time and we're like, uh, yeah, you have all of the things on the wall, but you don't abide by them. And really what happened is at one point, the business, you know, these businesses that have their sayings on the walls and they have old outdated playbooks. At one point, there was somebody there that cared. But what they failed to do is build in, you mentioned values. They didn't, they didn't hold fast to valuing culture. And then they didn't build accountability structures to make sure that what they valued was upheld continuously improved, iterated, and uh, continually updated as the future goes forward, because this stuff has to constantly be updated because culture changes, the marketplace changes, customers change, people change, right? Mm -hmm. And um, I, I think that th those become the really important rails uh, for, uh, for continuously succeeding in these areas into the future. Yeah. And I mean, it's it's a phrase that's come up. There's books written about it as a phrase that came up in a different uh, conversation I had a few days ago. Yeah. Freedom through discipline. Ooh, that's good. You know what I mean? So yeah. that to me plays into this conversation where okay. you want to innovate, you want to explore, you want to go out there and pitch your sales all over the place. Fine. You uh -huh. can gain that freedom if you have that discipline at home at in your organization. So the more that you're organized, the more you can play yeah yeah it's 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 amazing it's amazing what good organization will do to uh the business and to the people absolutely you know garrett so for you to understand how you ended up here can you give me some insights on what your career started out as to date just uh you know highlights the overview but starting particularly on when you stepped into your education whether it was college or not maybe it was directly into the workforce how did you pick your direction? And then what did that look like to now? 
Yeah. So I am a, I'm an accidental entrepreneur. Um, went to college, wanted to be an actor, couldn't handle the rejection, decided I still, I loved speaking. So I was like, well, I'll be Tony Robbins. I want to be like Tony Robbins and be a motivational speaker. So I went and did, uh, got a degree in speech communication. Um, after that, the Tony Robbins thing didn't work out. So we, you know, went and got a job, uh, went to work for Gallo, learned a ton, uh, uh Gallo wine, largest mm -hmm. winery in the world, learned a ton about sales and marketing was amazing. Four years there, got drafted uh, to another beverage company out of Boston, worked for them about four years. Again, learned more about distribution, about uh, national and global marketing, um, a ton about re really great sales. And then after about eight, eight years, I just um, fell out of love with the corporate America. And so I didn't know what I wanted to do, but I know that I didn't want to do that. So I cashed in my 401k. I think it was like 13 grand. <laughs> I thought I thought I was so rich, you know. Uh, it's so funny looking back. Um, yeah. <laughs> and then um, I didn't know what I was going to do, but I, I had a couple of loves, a, a love for aquatics. I have a pretty extensive aquatics background. And I loved photography, even though I'd never owned a camera. So started teaching swimming lessons, bought a camera, started doing them both. Swimming lessons made me money. Photography was just, I was like, if you're a human, I'll take photos of you. And um, after about a year, the photography thing became a business. I put all my focus there, built a uh, professional wedding and portrait photography business for the next 10 years. And um, you know, we ended up doing 400 weddings over that time, had a, a large team. The film lab died in 2005. All of the film labs shut down. Digital showed up. It was a radical inflection point. And um, I had, we, we became the lab and the photography studio simultaneously. That was really painful. So I sought to solve my own problem. That turned into a new business, which was a digital lab driven by the internet where photographers shooting digital media could just upload their photos to us. We would process them the way the old film lab would. And then we would send it straight back to them via the internet. And um, that kicked off in 2007, went gangbusters um, and, uh, you know, gr gr grew like crazy. And that mm -hmm. really, uh, my photography business, I, I definitely uh, learned a ton about people and process and scaling. Uh, that became a national brand. Um, but it wasn't until my, my, uh, shoot.edit business showed up that I really, um, was challenged with at least scale for a, you know, we'll call it a small business. Uh, ultimately that turned into hiring about 550 employees worldwide, um, and a whole host of other really amazing things, but very complex, difficult problems, uh, that I, I had to face. And um, that brought me up to about 2020, where I had plenty of strong leaders in place. Uh, sorry, 2022, plenty of strong leadership and uh, leaders in place to run the businesses. And um, I just really started thinking about what is my next contribution um, to to my family, to the workplace. And uh, I really felt like the the I I didn't feel like I fell in love with this sort of uh, trifecta of taking people process and performance and organizing them for maximum output in a way where the business can scale uh, order in an uh, orderly way, but also protects its people and cares for its people so that their efficiencies are maximized, but they're also happy, you know, in general, much more happy. And then there's a cascade of positive benefits that hit the business and the people uh, when you architect and you build the right way. It's a pretty, pretty darn amazing. So you had mentioned before, I had asked you about the happiness component of your answer. Then you went into why you believe that way. Yeah. Was there a particular point along this path you just shared with us where that really sunk in? <sighs> yeah. Yeah, there was. <clears throat> it was a painful one. So probably back in, um, about 11 years ago, 
uh, the chairman of my board at the time, who I had a great relationship with then and still do now, he came into my office and he was like visibly kind of angry. And he sat down and he said, Garrett, mm -hmm. if you don't stop micromanaging your people and your business, you're going to kill it and you're going to harm them more than you ever can imagine. And I didn't understand at the time what he meant, but I was eager to understand and learn. And what that revealed was um, I was the classic you know, entrepreneur that built a business that was succeeding, but didn't have infrastructure. And my gut response was to um, grasp at controlling everyone and everything because I didn't have control. It's really interesting things like, you know, um, and, and the big epiphany was, dude, I'm operating in disorder. And and that ha that that's causing so much pain and you know innovation delays go to market delays loss of quality loss of speed uh all of these you know bad things um you, you know uh, our it, it, uh, employee retention was horrible you, you know and when um, you say your board the board for the digital lab oh oh i'm board of directors uh, but chairman. for the for the digital lab yeah that's right okay okay yeah yeah, that's right. Sorry about that. No, no. And and so that that took me just on this journey of like self reflection. Another good thing he he taught me along the way was, um, uh, anytime anything is going wrong, your job as the leader is to first ask yourself, maybe it's me. And I really took that to heart. And um, you know, like I said, John, my big epiphany was, I was trying to scale and grow, without a foundation of. Uh, architected order mm -hmm. and sturdiness. And um, that's why I was such a micromanager because I was trying to control, trying to control everything because I didn't have control. Yeah. yeah. Uh, as you were telling that story, all I pictured was you trying to build the bridge as you were crossing it with <laughs> yeah. your people behind you, as opposed to the opposite scenario that would be them behind you building it as you're pointing which direction to go. Yeah. Because now at that point, they already have the manuals, the handbooks. They can tell you where the boards go and how to set them up for the sturdiness and whatnot for the structure. That's all I pictured was you try, <laughs> you trying to build a bridge so that they could cross with you as opposed to them building it. And you saying, OK, from from an overview, this is where we have to head. Yes. Yes. Uh, you, you know what else comes to mind as you're sharing that visual, which is a great one, is the story of Lewis and Clark, you know, like true pioneers but they didn't know where they were going or what they were doing and the amount of disaster they put themselves through and they put the people that they were leading through was astronomical and, and obviously great things came as a result uh, I, I guess you know one could argue but um you know in in business that's the wrong play <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. The they, wrong... they were going into a frontier that was, you know, yeah. not known at all. Granted, business is the same way, but there, there are guideposts typically. Um, you know, you know the market you're going into. So the comparison, yeah, yeah. yeah. But there... the severity of it makes you feel like that. Yeah. Because there are dire results if you don't pay attention. Yeah, I think there's enough history in business mm. where... 99.9% .9 of ventures, you know, are not the Lewis and Clark. Probably there's that one, there is that one percentile that are true pioneers and they are uh, bushwhacking every which way. Amazon was one of them, by the way, right? But gosh, they're venture backed. They had so much money on their runway that they could burn and, uh, and weather that storm, you know? Yeah. And when you say you went to college and you chose to study speech and communications, aside from like the Tony Robbins example and yeah. um, and goal, does it make sense for you that that's what you went into? Did you have that kind of personality going into college, like the speaker, the the orator of sorts? I did. I sure did. Uh, what led me actually to acting was um, a, a 
a, a lot of years on the uh, speech tournament circuit. So uh, oh, yeah. in junior okay. high, high school, and and early college, there's uh, what's which was called you know speech. We just called speech yeah. and debate. You, you, yeah, uh, and I was always drawn to the oratory, and I was always drawn to the what, what were called uh, dramatic interpretations of literature. And so um, it was the dramatic stuff that really I loved, which which is you know kind of led me down the acting trail. Where did that come from? I mean, I, I guess a lot of people can relate to that, but was there anybody in your family that kind of made that impression on you of that, or was just something the dreamer in you as a kid, as, as a young person? Yeah, that, that's a, actually a great question, John. No, there, there was nobody in my blood that I'm aware of that were, that were uh, actors, however, uh, a ton of musicians. Um, Very so, similar vein. Yeah. Yeah, you know, diff different outlet, but definitely yeah. both, uh, you know, on the performance side. Garrett, for you, does it make sense? And here's a follow up to that. Does it make sense from your childhood, who you were as a kid, that this is what you're doing now? So not that they have to tie out specifically or that you knew this is what you were going to do, but your personality as a kid, how do you reconcile that to what you're doing now? Wow. I, I Well, it's so funny. I don't think I would have ever imagined because as a kid I, I was the creative kid so i loved the arts loved you know just creativity i i you know really wasn't a scholastic kid at all um uh, so i was always kind of driven by the right brain um and so it's been really interesting to watch over the years where um i i where it en ended up really falling in love with was this sort of left brain side of things, which mm -hmm. is fascinating. Um, and I, I think it turns out my, my right brain really helps in that area. Uh, so they're, they're a nice, uh, they're a nice compliment, but no, never saw it coming. Photography that, that worked out, you know, the photography yeah. thing, that worked out and that helped. Um, but I like but, that. I like that, that visual that you paint of the brain and the sides and where you were, expressing yourself in the creative as a younger person now you're going more to like the technical side but right. i think it is it's great i think the 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 most successes that we see um come from that being able to infuse one side into the other yeah yeah because i, I mean you you see the you see the 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 script of that side but you're also carrying with you okay what's possible where yeah. can i go you know what can i sounds hokey but what can i dream about what you know it's it's limitless what's available if we just kind of get that curious with that uh with that creativity love that yeah and i figure too you know um heck we have both sides of the brain for a reason exactly and, and so to capitalize on uh, on both sides is is pretty cool yeah Garrett, this is a, a new one, a new question I've asked the last couple episodes, uh, and okay. you may have mentioned it since we've been talking the last couple of minutes, but what's your superpower? What would you consider your superpower? And I, I, ask, I ask that question just because I, I love hearing people talk about or express specifically what they're good at. It's not a comparison to other people, but this is this is me. Like This is where I stand out. This is my superpower. Yeah. Uh John, I have a, a two-part answer. Yeah. Uh, uh, and there's a dependency there. So, um, you know, I believe in God and I believe he created us. And anything that good comes out of us comes from him. Mm -hmm. And so I uh, and, and so my source of anything good is him. So he through him, I have superpowers. And as a result, where, where those have really begun to show up uh, in, in the area of business is um, architecting order organizationally in a business for scale. Uh, I would say that that is my superpower. Somehow, some way, when I go into businesses, I just can see things that people don't see. I can't explain it. Uh, and fortunately, I know how to then take that disorder, the chaos, uh, the disorganization or the, the gaps and reorganize and re-architect so that the business can get after their goals faster uh, and um, and sustainably. Would you say your, 
you're comfortable with chaos? Um, let's see. I mean, obviously there's scales of how yeah. much chaos, but yeah. <laughs> some people are really thrown off by any sense of chaos where it seems like you feel comfortable seeing the overall picture, picking the pieces apart and kind of putting it back together. Yeah. It, it, you know, it's so funny. I, I especially feel comfortable with chaos when I'm the operational partner, especially because um, I can see the force of the trees and I mm. know the outcome. Um, when it comes to my own businesses, I'm hyper allergic. So I, I, um, I'm, I'm probably a little bit more antsy and, um, that's fair. Yeah. Right. <laughs> there's, there's more on the line. So I'm a little more antsy and, uh, a, a little more, f f a lot more fast because I can control my resources to, uh, to fix it quick. Uh, cause I, I just cannot stand living in it when I'm living in it, you know? Uh, and Garrett, one last question before we dive yeah. into the book. What does yeah. leadership mean to you? Uh, I think you've hinted at it, painted a picture around it, but if is is there anything else you would add to your definition of leadership and great leadership? Yeah. By the way, the topic of leadership, we could probably talk for months on that one, right? Oh, absolutely. absolutely. It's, it's a moving target. Oh, it is. It, it is. Um, but I would say... I, I coined a little acronym a little while ago. I call it PI. Uh, you know, um, leadership hopefully can be as easy as PI. Uh, the P stands for being professional. Um, the I stands for integrity. And the E stands for EQ or empathy. And so I, I think that leadership is uh, succinctly wrapped up into that PI acronym. Um, and if and we, you know, we won't get into it, but uh, it's fun to then go define professional, define integrity, and define empathy EQ. Uh, and when you define those out, you'll see, in my opinion, there you have a leader. And the one thing I would wrap that up with is um, Bill Campbell. Uh, he is the, the focus of the book, The Trillion Dollar Coach. Uh, famous. Oh, I actually read that. Did you? It's that's, it's that's around right. here somewhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. He had passed away, right? He did. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but oh man, it's such a great book, right? Yeah. Um, what What were your some of your takeaways? What, were you, what do you think of that? Well, what I was going to just you know end the pie thing with is uh, he said, which really impacted me: you cannot be a great leader unless you were first a great manager. And he attributes great management to being a professional, and he attributes also, uh, the values that come with being a great manager, kind of just good old fashioned caring for people, um, walking a mile in their shoes, having walked in their shoes. He attributes to, um, you know, do what you say you will do, lead from the front, um, you know, uh, uh, manage what you measure. Like all, of, all of these pie attributes, yeah. um, he, you know, he, he says that in order to be a great leader, first you need to possess these. And then people will naturally follow you because you've demonstrated by example that you are these things and you're trustworthy and dependable and faithful and timely. Yeah, I read that book a couple of years ago and I can picture the cover in my mind, like a blue cover, the That's title right. and, and him at the bottom with like, he's got a hat on, like looks That's very, right. very casual. And when yeah. I remember the book, I'm bad with specifics, but it was a great book. I just remember how he was just known in his industry. So people would just call him up and he would show up. And it was kind of like he talked sense into these leaders that he was working with because he painted that picture that those considerations, those acknowledgments that they would have to put into place and really take on to move forward effectively. But that was a great book. I forgot yeah. about that one. Yeah, he he was an old football coach. And um, par part of his appeal was he was a no-nonsense dude. Like, he didn't tippy-toe around. He was a straight shooter. He also was really charismatic, and people loved him. Um, uh, you know, so he had this really nice balance of, mm. of care and accountability without, um, you know, he didn't worry about what people thought because he 100% believed in everything he said. And yeah. Pretty great. Yeah, that honesty, that candor is is powerful. That's come up on on this series before. Mm. Um, just as long as it's coming from the right place and it's not That's about right. ego, it's not about condescension, but really 
telling the people, the, the person you're talking to the truth for the betterment of them, for the betterment of your organization, that um, just that honesty is just such an important ingredient to add to that conversation. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. And, and when you, when you, you know, I, I love the word candor, when you, when you balance, you know, candor with care, um, people really respect that. I, I think they really do. Uh, especially in business, like you have to get the work done. You have to execute. Yeah. Um, but if you also simultaneously, you know, like we've been talk, talked about a lot today so far, and, and that is um, care for people through the way you design process and through the way you you, uh, you execute um, lots of different ways. Uh, great things happen. Great things happen. Yeah. And th that candor with care, it's something you rarely see. Yeah. You know, yeah. rarely see because you'll have too much of one or too much of the other, but you rarely see that combination of just being matter of fact. Maybe mm -hmm. it's something nobody wants to hear, but you can tell the person saying it for the right reasons. Yeah. It's not yeah. To, to demonstrate their power. It's not to hold somebody down or put somebody down. It's like you just don't see it enough where it's like, okay, let's talk about where the foundation really is, where we really are before we we start building up. So yeah. I love that that came up in this conversation. For sure. Garrett, at this point, why don't we jump into the book that you wanted to discuss and kind of give us some insights on how you came across the book? Yeah. So the the book um, I, I had shared with you that I would love to talk about is uh, called Becoming Facebook, the 10 challenges that defined the company that's disrupting the world. And uh, I read this back actually in 2017. And um, it, it was uh, uh, written by uh, Mike Hofflinger, who was there uh, uh, at the time, I think he was there f seven years, five or seven years. Uh, he was their director of global business marketing um, and really was the, the key driver um, uh, around their decisions and approach to scaling innovation. Um, and, um, you, you know, he just, that, that's what the, the book is about, um, their monumental vision and about, uh, you know, uh, what often most people probably would view as insurmountable mountains and, and challenges, but because they focused uh, by design, by design on people, culture, uh, execution and doing the unprofitable, difficult things, mm -hmm. he believed was the reason that they um, have changed the world the way they have. So for you in looking at this book, um, what is it that stands out in terms of, or what is the the path that the, the author takes the reader on? What's that journey? Because uh, I'm always just curious about what somebody's going to find in the book, start to finish, but an overview, like what do the chapters look like? How, how does he tell that story? Yeah. Well, um, in, in reading that book, I actually connected the dots, um, to my business in the past. And, and really the way he structured the book was in, into people process and performance. Um, and then the, the book kind of takes you on this journey of, uh, challenges, which were both vision-based tech-based and people-based. Um, and then it gets very technical into how they solve their technical problems, how they approached their people challenges. And then also, um, they, he does a really good job of getting into the measurable metrics of once you, um, you know, build these solutions and strategize for how you're going to take those to market, uh, how you have to, how they had to, and how he suggests you must go about building accountability structures to sustain that execution into the future. Um, and, and then there's uh, uh, other things, you know, he, he often comes back to Zuckerberg um, and gives Zuckerberg uh, quite a bit of credit, which, um, you know, uh, 
he he's got you know varying degrees of um, you know interpretations about the kind of leader he is. But Mike thought he was a pretty great leader, um, especially when it came to vision, strategy, and culture. Um, and so, like sometimes he would rabbit hole here and there. One of the rabbit holes I loved is he talked about how Mark was relentless. And by the way, I think for any business leader, founder, CEO that is in, uh, focused on winning, um, he was relentless about winning and, um, he was a future caster. So he would, uh, Mark's thing was he would look to to optimize for the current platform and make sure that his advertisers and his customers were taken care of. Um, but he would simultaneously be building the next platform and then simultaneously a portion of their resources and energy would be building for the next, next platform. He called it the trifecta effect. And so um, that that's kind of, you know, that that's the, the weave I experienced throughout the book, but it always, always came back to people, culture, ex execution, and doing the difficult things because you have to. What are some of those difficult things in terms of that that book, in terms of Facebook? Um, the difficult yeah. things. Yeah. So, um, one of the big undifficult things, or sorry, one of the big difficult things was um, uh, doing things that were unprofitable which I really love. I, I really love uh, uh, that Mike talked about this. Uh, and uh, prior to the show, actually, was just kind of reviewing some of my notes from the book. So that's in chapter 15, where he talks about, um, you know, a lot of businesses, most businesses, uh, irrespective of side, they pursue the revenue. Mm. Um, they pursue sales and marketing. They forget about infrastructure. They forget about rails. They don't focus on culture. Um, they they, they uh, ha don't have accountability structures. They just want sales, sales, sales. And um, he, he gave Mark the credit. Mark was smart enough to go like, hey, if we're going to win, we have to have a foundation. We have to have a foundation. Um, and so he calls that doing the unprofitable stuff. Mm -hmm. um, another thing he talked about um, that was really difficult, but um, highly valuable and very rewarding to the business of the people. And that was um, pursuing by design, hiring and finding the right people. And he talks about defining great. First define what great is for the great people that you want to hire and then go find them. Um, and then, uh, uh, you know, another difficulty they faced continuously is, uh, you know, the toxicity that wants to rear up in culture. And so uh, the way they combated the, 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 the difficult parts of culture is they prioritized focus and unity, which I love. Like, you know, I, I, I think it's unfortunate that we have to go find these nuggets in a, yeah. in a book <laughs> that most people don't read. Yeah. But, you know, there's a reason why these companies win. You know, it's just not talked about. And also, it turns out they're the the one or two percent that that actually win because uh, they're busy doing, not busy, you know, pontificating. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it's it's so tricky with those with those um, kind of businesses or you know many many kinds of businesses across different industries where they're instead of living or working that infinite game, right? Yeah. Well, getting everything solid first, they're trying to keep up with quarterly earnings. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? They're just yeah. living a quarter at a time. Um, so it's always fascinating when some organizations can really take stock of what's important and really build it the right way. Uh, I don't think he ever imagined where that company would be when he was building that page in his dorm room at Harvard. Right. Um, yeah. And it's easy for people to pontificate, to criticize from the outside. But I mean, I don't think we can really comprehend the scale of what no. he and his team have built in the last, I don't know, what's it coming up on 20 years or something like that. Yeah. Even, even even earlier than that. I think he was in school in the 90s. So, yeah. Um, it, no, I, I'm with you. Uh, and, and yet simultaneously, 
you know, he has demonstrated that he brought to the org and still continues to bring to the business and the org and the people grit, determination, focus, um, right? The, like these, uh, uh, you know, doing the hard stuff. Um, and I, I think those are winning traits, you know, and, and I think they're uh, by and large missing in most businesses. And I think the stats prove it. Nine out of 10 businesses fail. I, I read a stat recently that said it's actually a little higher than that. Um, and so it's all of, you, you know, these, the, the, the DNA uh, of these moving parts in the, this engine of success. Um, it, it's a thousand moving parts, John, right? I like to say it's, it's either death by a thousand cuts or success by a thousand optimizations. <laughs> and um, I, I think Facebook uh, and many others, by the way, um, but, you know, Facebook has demonstrated they uh, are in the relentless pursuit of the thousand optimizations and they refuse to become legacy. Garrett, you had said the book came out in 2017. That's when I read it. Okay. I don't, okay. I don't know if okay. It came out in 2017, though. Yeah. yeah. I'm just curious of your take of um, what you read in the book versus everything that's happened since. Because, like we said, the world evolves so quickly. Yeah. Um, you know, you admire the company, the work, the grit, the, the unpopular decisions it has to make, the unprofitable work it has to do. But do you have some kind of take on you know when the book was written versus how Facebook is operating now? I mean, there's just so many things that have changed in that time. Yeah, yeah. you know, I I don't, and I I did want to um, maybe just quickly comment. I'm not like a Facebook fanboy. <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Uh, I just love a good founder story. I love a good business story, and that's uh, you know the book. That's all I took it as. I didn't see okay. you here as a, a surrogate for. <laughs> <laughs> for Zuckerberg or anything like that. But I'm, yeah, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm fascinated, obviously, with you having built various businesses. I'm curious. I was just curious what your take was based on what you read in the book and what that company, because you read it in 2017, didn't come yeah. out in that year. Yeah. But even from then to now, things have changed so much where you have that the first, I don't know, whatever, couple of years where it's like, okay, we're still a young company. Now we're in the mid range. Now we're in the, the longer range of our existence. Yeah. Um, that company's just, I think it's like the, the one company we talk about every day. I mean, it's incredible. Obviously it's, it's global reach. Um, so I, I'm, I'm curious about that. It's just what that, that company has gone through now in like these later years versus those formative years, because the, it, the landscape is changing and it's uh -huh. always got a target on its back. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, let, let's see. I, I actually, John, I don't know enough about how they're operating now, um, versus how they're operating then. Like for example, one of their North star metrics, uh, that they, um, it took them a couple years to figure out this was the thing that was going to catapult their growth was they needed to see a brand new user be on the platform every single day for two weeks straight from the moment they join. Weird. It took them two years to figure out that there was a direct correlation, measurable correlation between that metric and the user staying on the platform and becoming a permanent user. So like there's something that probably, I, I would, I don't know, but I would guess probably doesn't apply these days because of all of their uh, different products that they've they've launched and acquisitions uh, that they've made. Um, so like there, there's something, there's an, a, an example. That said, I think the primary principles that I learned and read about in the book, uh, again, going back to kind of the, the, the four categories, people, culture, execution, and mm -hmm. doing the difficult things, I think those still apply. And I, I think those principles will continue to apply um, uh, in, in business. So you can transfer those um, to other businesses. So if somebody was maybe thinking about reading this book, they're like, well, I'm not in the tech field, so it doesn't apply to them. You still have lessons in there that people can draw out for other industries. Unequivocally. Oh, 
Oh yeah. Uh, hundred, hundred percent. I, I mean, it, you know, his thoughts about, um, it, Zuckerberg's uh, like on people, him realizing I'm, I'm going to be, and I need to be the vision guy. I'm going to be, and I need to be the strategy guy. I'm going to be, and I need to be the culture guy. Like th this is my, this is my, my wheelhouse. He also, he also realized engineering as much as he was sort of the original engineer, he could mm -hmm. not compete. So he needed to find great people to, to lead that product. Um, he realized I'm not a product guy. I need experts in this area when it came to global business development, that not his sweet spot. So like the, that principle of understanding where you're strong, I met, you mentioned earlier, your superpowers and, um, being able to bring the most value to your lane and then, um, and then finding the areas of the business that you have gaps or need expertise and properly placing them like that principle applies. And I, I just can't imagine it ever going away. It's a critical yeah. path. Yeah. When it comes to you, just based on your experience, where you find your passions and your work, your career, your businesses, do you see any writing uh, in, in your your future any anything that you want to get to to kind of contribute to the just that world of organizational structure and people and everything that we've talked about in this conversation yes yes that that has been a um i think the last 18 months there's been a a, a book baby growing in me <laughs> oh God. No. yeah uh so yeah, yeah go ahead i'm sorry no no please Please. No, I was just going to say, just because just based on your your experience, everything you've done to date, the different fields that you've worked in, obviously the interest that you have just in, in learning about Facebook through that the book that you've shared. Uh, I'm always just curious, based on people's experiences, their own unique voice, their own lessons, what they can put together in a package and, and share with the world. That's why I ask. I, I appreciate that. Yeah, I, I think, it. Um, you know, what I, I think about it a lot, actually. And uh, I get really overwhelmed about how do you do that? You know, how, how do I take all this stuff in my head um, and put it into a book? But um, thank you for asking the question because it, it added a little fire into me about the, the opportunity. You just got to get started and, it's and great that I'd love to write a book. I, I'm on that same kind of path, a similar I, parallel path. Okay. Um, I don't have your experience. haven't built the companies that you have, but yeah, just get started. I, you know, you say it's overwhelming. You got to think of, of yourself, I guess, as one of these organizations that you go into, right? You know, they're, they're getting ahead of themselves, kind of getting overwhelmed. It's like, okay, let's stop and, and, put the processes in place here, the different manuals for you, they'd be chapters on how right. to do different things. Yep. Um, but I, I think I, I'd be interested, especially for you as somebody who wanted to go into active acting, um, oration, uh, expression, the creativity. I'm always interested when somebody can bring, and you probably would just because it's in your nature, it's there mm -hmm. somewhere. That was like your foundation. There's, it's always interesting when somebody incorporates that kind of creativity and insight into the technical work of the business. So count me a reader whenever you put that book out. <laughs> awesome, John. Likewise, likewise. Maybe, maybe we can hold each other accountable. Absolutely. <laughs> and Garrett, in wrapping up, is there anything that you're up to these days that you want to share? Anything I might not have asked? You know, We're limited on time. I always have more questions, but is there anything that you'd want to share that I... I didn't cover it all. Uh, please, the floor is yours. Yeah, thanks, John. Well, yeah, yeah, uh, I'll share this thought. My hypothesis is that there is a new generation of leadership and there's a new generation of teammates Um and I guess everybody in an org in some form or fashion is a leader. But when I say leader, I'm referring to the people that are paid to and charged with making the sort of, you know, macro decisions for, for the biz. Um, and, and I, this new generation uh, doesn't want the old way of doing things. They don't want 
to win at all cost. Um, they they actually do want and are looking for um, work true work life balance. They are looking for environments in business that are orderly, um, where the business wants to win, have a vision for success, a path for it, and the business is able to articulate that to the people. And um, and, and so I, I, I think my encouragement to myself and to your listeners is, uh, if that's you, lean in, lean in. Um, because I, th I think that wave is coming and the more people talk about it and acknowledge that it's actually good and healthy, I think the, uh, the, 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 the faster the ripple effect will make its way into the, the business marketplace. Um, I, I've really been thinking a lot lately about this idea, most of us, we have to work for a living because we need money to live. And so, which means most of us spend eight, 10, 12, 15 hours a day at our workplace. And if that workplace is toxic, if it's high stress, low happiness, if it's chaotic, if it's disorderly, that creates all of this negative emotions in our mind and heart, which then we take home. Mm. So, which means we're being paid to be stressed out. And then we're being paid to take that into our personal life too. Yeah. And I, I think the new generation gets that and they don't want it. They don't want it anymore. Our, our, our parents were, were all in, but the new generation doesn't. And, um, and so that, that's my hypothesis, but also for those who agree with me, I just want to like fan you into flames and encourage you to, to go make it happen and, um, you know, connect with people. Don't do it alone. Connect with people that are like-minded that agree with you and, um, and make a change. And Garrett, for you, did you, I mean, obviously that echoes a, a lot from the pandemic, but what were your views on the state of work through the pandemic? Did you see an uptick in the work that you were doing uh, because of the impact of the pandemic and just organizations really trying to be thorough and um, just focused on what employees needed? Yeah. Whether they stayed there or they've made their way back to past practices to be debated. Um, but what are your thoughts on just the pandemic? It, obviously, it, it aligns with what you're saying. Did you see it accelerate that that mindset? Uh, you know what? It was twofold. Uh, I think on on one hand, as um, you know, most businesses in the world were forced to um, send people home and no longer work in the brick and mortar location or at the office. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, that, that was like a huge blessing for people not to have to spend, you know, one, two, three hours a day commuting. Um, and uh, to have this personal time back, I think that was a big eye opener for, for me, for all of our teammates. And you and I probably agree for the world. Um, on the flip side, there was this, you know, um, difficult thing that came with us w with it. And that is, um, you know, we're, we're social creatures. And, um, after a while, I think there became this undercurrent of, Ooh, I'm, I'm kind of lonely. I'm, I'm like, you, I miss the water cooler talk. I, yeah. I miss, go, you know, going into wherever we break for lunch, whether we go out or we sit at the, you know, the, in, in the, wherever you break for lunch and hang out with people, that kind of went away. Actually, it went away. <laughs> yeah, and, yeah. and remote remote can't satisfy that, you know? And um, so I, 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 I love, uh, I, I, my big takeaway is going back to work-life balance. I, I think this, the idea of hybrid is golden. And, and now that it's uh, being accepted, I think it's such a great balance, you know? Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, there's experiences with my kids that I wouldn't have had if I was still in the office five yeah. days a week, you know, right. nine to five. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's been a blessing. 
especially in formative years. My kids are on the younger side, but it's been incredible. So okay, uh, yeah, we'll how, see. How you know, kids? my kids are nine, nine, five, and two. Okay, okay. So we're talking about little stuff like taking them to the bus stop, picking them up at the bus stop, taking them to camp, picking them up from camp, just being there. Yes. Um, you That's know, not having to wait an hour and a half, two hours after they've been home to see them. Like I'm there from the get go and it's more family time, obviously. So, um, um, you know, it's a silver lining to a global tragedy, but uh, yeah. I'm grateful for that time. Um, and again, the book that we covered with Garrett was uh, Becoming Facebook by Mike Hofflinger. That's right. Um, Garrett, thank you for your time. Thank you for just going through your background, your experience, your work, your businesses, and just um, the book itself and and just how we can apply those kind of mentalities and, and modalities to just, I like the ability to just transfer that attention to mm -hmm. other areas where it's kind of, again, just that freedom through discipline, getting the work done so you're building off that right foundation. So I appreciate your time so much. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, John. Really appreciate being here and, and uh, talking shop. Really great stuff. Absolutely. If there's anything I might have missed that you think I should have asked, obviously limited on time, but if you do think there's something I could have asked or gotten into, please shoot me an email and I'll reach out to Garrett and see what kind of insights, guidance, knowledge I can get back. In the meantime, thank you for watching. Thank you for listening and I'll talk to you soon. Take care. Bye.